so we'll welcome everybody in. Um, happy to have this first uh, event in a, a series that we're entitling "It Takes a Village." Uh, and really, for those of you on that have been or that have been here for a second, Laura and I were just kind of talking about how it's so appropriate that it really does take a village for for our community, for us individual to make inroads. And we rely on so many people, whether it's the medical community, the therapists, each other. Um, we, yeah, we, we need folks in, in, our, in our village to help us out from time to time. And that's what this series is meant to kind of emulate is that we want to have a series of events twice per month where we bring on therapists, where we bring on, uh, whether it's maybe we're talking about town halls and doing open fireside chats where families will come on and share their stories for others to learn from in a more personal way. The Facebook threads are great for knowledge, but sometimes just having a, a virtual personal connection is really wonderful. And so this is something that, that Wendy and I uh, had been chatting about probably for a couple of months now. Uh, it was honestly like the first thing we were like, this is what we want to bring uh, as a kind of collaboration to the community. And I think, Wendy, we should give credit to, to Chris and Fiona's work uh, previously where- Oh yes, held, hi. Yeah, when they held the musical uh, therapy sessions, that was kind of one of the inspirations behind this is just seeing the different families and the kids uh, all hopping on a call on a Saturday and going through that experience was, it was really enriching for, for our family personally. And we found a lot of value. And we wanted to take that inspiration and, and branch it out and see, you know, how many families we could touch and, and pull into the experience. So, uh, Wendy, do you want to take a moment and just introduce yourself? Make sure yeah. uh, I, I have Wendy that opportunity. Knows who I am. Uh, hopefully those in the UK uh, registered with uh, Kleeta Syndrome um, Org would have had an email um, mentioning the event that we're starting off. Um, this is the first one of that event um, managed by Laura Graham, as you can see, waiting patiently. Thank you, Laura. Um, and this one is probably um, a bit more on the educational and the, as parents, you'll take, you'll take forward from this some, some hints and tips and some knowledge that you can then use with your, with your children. Um, but as Jeff said, what we wanted for the events was um, to actually bring you a package almost um, and have a date that you know that um, that's when you'll log on, that's when you'll have a look and you'll meet people, you'll see, depending on the size of the people that we've got in the room, sometimes we can use um, uh, the Zooms and sometimes it, it needs to be more of a, a webinar event. But that's what we thought we wanted to bring to you, um, things that you would want, you'll find interesting, your children will love, you'll get stimulated, you'll get a break, you know, you'll have a bit of fun, you'll enjoy it, and you'll take something away from it. So that was um, what we talked about. And interestingly, we both came up with the same idea, uh, which was really quite like, well, we were talking about that, we were talking about that, and, and then decided, well, there's no point going um, off separately to do this, so we'll do it as a collaboration and do it together. Um, so I'm assuming our, we have got people from all over the world, maybe, as we are virtual, um, and uh, hopefully you're all able to speak English and uh, mine. Uh, you can hear clearly enough. Um, but I think um, we have got some already set up that are going to be promoted um, shortly. And we'll probably only ever um, do it on a sort of a lookout for it. You, know, you now know the dates, you now know the times, so you'll look out for it and we'll keep you up to date. And it'll be on all of our websites, all of our Facebooks uh, and all of our social media. Um, so maybe we ought to um, pass this over to Laura. Thank you very much. Hey, okay, thanks Wendy and Jeff. I will just share my screen. There we go. Just get that PowerPoint up. Oh, the beginning. There we go. Thank you, everybody. Um, and hello and welcome to an introduction to sensory processing differences uh, that I've been asked to present today uh, by Wendy and Jeff. And just by way of introduction, my name is Laura and I am a 
paediatric occupational therapist practicing in the UK, in the Midlands. I have an independent practice. And that means that I work with individuals from very teeny tiny young children all the way up to, to 25 um, who have got additional needs that impact on their daily life. Um, before I um, set up my own independent practice, I worked for the National Health Service for a long time, working with individuals with learning disabilities and intellectual disabilities and conditions such as autism, cerebral palsy, as well as some lesser known conditions. Um, and today I'm here to talk about sensory processing differences that I think um, from some of the questions that I've had sent in prior to today is something that's piqued a lot of people's interests. So today we're going to look at the, the fact that we've got more than five senses. To some of you that won't be news and to others, others you might be a bit like, what, more than five? We're going to think about what sensory differences um, could mean for your child and what we can do to support our children's sensory differences. We're going to look a little bit about the role of occupational therapists. Often we are heavily involved in equipment and adaptations but we can offer a lot more than that. And then we'll finish with just some useful links and organisations and then an opportunity for any questions or, or queries that anybody might have. You can type those into the, the chat box and, and George and Wendy will kind of keep on top of that and I can uh, to see if we've got some time to answer that at the end. So we will kick off now. So what is sensory processing? Um, I'm going to refer to it as sensory processing differences, not sensory processing difficulties or not sensory processing disorder. And that's because there is not a standalone diagnosis in the manuals that paediatricians, that psychiatrists, that medics use to make diagnosis. There is no such thing yet as sensory processing disorder. So when I'm referring to SPD, I'm referring to um, sensory processing differences. But often what we see is that individuals with a range of developmental coordinate, developmental disorders, um, neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism spectrum disorders or other genetic syndromes um, can present with sensory processing differences. And sensory processing differences can have an impact on every single thing we do from eating, sleeping, um, our personal activities of daily living, so hair washing, nail cutting, teeth cleaning, um, tolerance of the clothes that we wear, and also activity level, attention level. Um, and um, as I go on further to describe some individuals um, within this um, or, or some examples within this presentation, we'll learn a bit more about sensory avoiding and sensory seeking behaviours and, and the impact that that can have on community participation, on, on education. So it really does um, touch across every element of, of life. And I think it's really important, a lot of you will, um, on your journeys with your children, will have come across occupational therapists. Uh, I often think that it's a little bit of a, a strange title, but for um, occupational therapy, it's so important that we look at everybody's occupations. And that isn't about their jobs, but that's about their leisure interests. That's about, for, ch for children in particular, that's their educational pursuits. It's their social participation, going out into the community, being able to attend family parties, being able to go to church. It's their play as a primary occupation for children what we refer to as ADLs or activities of daily living. They're the, the things of um, your personal activities of daily living that I've just discussed. So um, grooming, um, dressing, feeding, and other activities of daily living as individuals get older. It's being able to make a bed. It's being able to help prepare a meal or, or make a drink. And, and as individuals go through and finish their education, it's into the world of, of work and, and vocation. And occupational therapists have got um, an important role to play in ensuring that all that can be met. And often that's about looking at the environment. It's about making ad adaptations. It's about looking at um, equipment that can support, about looking at, at wheelchairs or specialist beds, or for some individuals, it might be hoist mobility equipment. But it's also very much about looking at the sensory environment and what is it that an individual is needing more of or needing less of, and how can we respond to that? 
So just for the purpose of this um, presentation today, you might hear me talk and use the word sensory integration and sensory processing or sensory integration dysfunction and sensory processing disorder or differences. For the purpose of today, that all means the same um, for this presentation. So I started off by, by saying that we have got more than five senses. We all know the big five. So our sense of hearing, our sense of vision, our sense of taste, our sense of smell, and our sense of touch, or to use the more formal phrases, our auditory, visual, olfactory, gustatory, and tactile senses. So most of us, we learn that we've got five senses. What we now actually know is that we have more than five senses, and we've got some of what we often refer to as hidden senses, and they are our vestibular sense, and our proprioceptive sense, and then our sense of interception. And what I'm gonna do on the, the following slides is talk about each of the senses in a bit more detail. And then I'm gonna be spending a bit more time talking about the tactile, vestibular and proprioceptive senses because they're the senses that often have a bigger uh, impact on, uh, on sensory needs and people know less about them. And I've just added this little cartoon in here because um, with sensory processing, we get all this information from our environment and our nervous system is the organ for sensory processing. And sometimes it is just too much. And some of you might relate with your young people that sensory overload can be something that is quite distressing for you all as a family and getting to the bottom of a, an individual's sensory needs is, is so key because it has an impact, not just on the child when they're dysregulated or distressed, but on the whole family on everybody being able to participate in the things that they want to do. So if we start off with our auditory or our hearing system, so our organs for this are our ears, and we're constantly getting sound waves coming in um, all the time. It is always working. Even when we are asleep, our auditory system is always working. And it is predominantly there to keep us safe. Most environments are filled with a lot of background noise. Just now I'm sat here in, in my office. I've got the window open. I can hear some birds outside. I can hear the dog padding around on the wooden floor. I can hear my children upstairs, but I've zoned out of that because I'm focusing on this. And it's I'm able to do that because I have a good level of sensory processing. My brain has sorted what's important. So if all of a sudden I was to hear a scream or a cry, then I would come out of this and I would be alerted to that straight away because my nervous system would cue in so that that's important. Whereas the bird making a noise outside or the dog padding around in the hallway isn't enough to alert me to, to, a, to a danger. Whereas for lots of individuals that I support, they can become very overwhelmed by auditory input. So they, um, they can't filter out what's important. So the television being on, the dishwasher being on, the clock ticking, um, traffic in the front of the house, all those things can become quite overwhelming. And a um, number of individuals that I work with can get quite distressed, busy environments, places like um, big supermarkets, big shopping centers, all those kind of places can be filled with so much auditory input that can be really distressing for, for individuals with sensory processing differences. We've then got our visual sense, um, which again, our organ for this is our eyes. Um, as long as our eyes are open, it is constantly taking on in environmental information. So if you just think about a regular classroom, for example, for, for children, there's often really bright, colorful displays all around the walls. There might be artwork hanging from the ceiling. There might be blinds in the window that waft in the breeze. You could have teachers wearing brightly colored dresses with brightly colored hair. You've got the movement of all the students moving around the environment. It's a highly visually stimulating environment. But our brain needs to filter and sort what's really important so that we're not attending to the picture that's up on the ceiling that's flapping in the wind. We're actually attending to the, the teacher at the front of the class. 
So some individuals can, again, become very overwhelmed by um, visual sensory input and others can really seek visual sensory input. So some individuals that I support, they like to um, use their iPads or their tablets and they like to watch very fast moving images. They like to get really, really close to, to television screens or to bubble tubes or that kind of sensory stimulation equipment and really seek high intensity visual stimuli. And that might interfere with their ability to attend and to concentrate um, to other things. We've then got our senses of taste and smell or our gustatory and olfactory senses. And um, our sense of taste acts very much as a, a warning. If we think back to our uh, ancestors, the uh, um, cave people that would be out foraging for, for food and they might come across some berries, they might eat these little purple berries. Um, they might then be very, very sick. And the next time they go out and they taste it, something that's got that same bitter taste, that could act as a warning to say, oh, last time I had that, I was really poorly, so I won't eat it. But we need our, our sense of taste through our taste buds in our mouth for our enjoyment of food. Our sense of smell is, is slightly different to all our other senses in that our um, sense of smell doesn't go through our kind of brainstem gatekeeper system. I'm not gonna go too much into the neurology, but our sense of smell has got a direct shortcut to our limbic system, which is our emotional brain. And that's why when we smell something, so it could be a perfume that reminds you straight away, you can smell a perfume and you could be taken back, you could go, oh, Gosh, that's the, the perfume my grandma used to wear. You can have a strong emotional response. It's why um, there's a lot of work with um, older adults with um, dementia and Alzheimer's. They will do reminiscence therapy. And a lot of the time they will look at using um, the smell of certain foods, um, certain hand creams that were very popular at the time to, to gain a response and that emotional response. And it's one of the hardest senses to... Um, to work out if somebody is really struggling with with smells because um, it gives such an emotional strong response and somebody doesn't always um, associate it with that with that smell so sometimes we can see some behaviors that challenge or some distress from an individual and we've got to try and be a bit of sensory detectives to work out what it is so um, I suppose one of the most common ones that I have is working in um, special needs schools um, there's a number of children that on certain days they are really reluctant to go into the cafeteria because there's quite a strong smell in there. They find that smell really abhorrent. Um, so they will get quite distressed um, about that because they find that quite unpleasant. We've then got our sense of touch or our tactile sensory system. And um, one of the questions that I'll go on to later that has been sent in um, is it very much around the tactile sensory system. But our organ for our um, tactile sense is our skin, and it is the first um, sensory system to develop in utero. And um, it has got lots and lots of receptors. So it tells us that we're touching something and we're being touched, it tells us about pressure, about texture, it tells us about the temperature of an item, the density, and also it has very um, close links to our pain receptors and our pain sensory system. So sometimes I'll work with individuals that seem to overreact to the smallest kind of graze or somebody rubbing past them or equally individuals that can have a nasty burn or a nasty cut and they don't seem to respond at all. And that can be because of difficulties with the tactile sensory processing. And our our sensory system has got two very distinct functions. So it allows us to discriminate the size of an object, the texture of an object, the shape, the temperature and the density. So um, if I was to, to say to you, oh, put your hands in your bag and find me your wallet or your car keys without looking, you'd be able to root around in your bag and you'd know what your car keys felt like. You wouldn't pull out your pack of tissues or you wouldn't pull out a coin. You would know what your car keys felt like because you've got good tactile discrimination. Whereas there are many individuals that I work with that have got quite poor tactile discrimination. So they have to use their visual sense as well as their, um, their skin, their, as well as feeling for something. Or they're so 
trying to um to work out what something is that they can be quite rough with it and they can they can break items and then the other um use of our tactile um, sensory system is to alert us to danger and so we refer to these as um, our discrimination and our defensiveness so um, you might have heard somebody say oh my child's tactile defensive or um, oh yes they're defensive in these these sensory traits and I've just put these little memes in here Billy listen I'm tactile seeking and you're tactile defensive either we go see an occupational therapist or this relationship is over um, and you don't really expect me to touch that do you and um, the tactile system is the one that many many parents contact me about because it has such an impact on things like grooming so those children that get so distressed having their hair washed or their teeth cleaned or their nails trimmed um, the children that really um, they're doing messy play and they don't they they don't want to get their hands in there they don't want to do that but equally on the flip side we can have the individuals that are really defensive and really avoidant and then we can have those that seek that if they can be sat in the middle of a bowl of jelly if they can have it all down their clothes if they can be under the water in the water constantly enjoying that that water play, that messy play, that playing in the sand, they seek that to a to a high degree of intensity. And that's um can sometimes be be a challenge when when that's what they want to do all the time. Um and just this one. We're behind I've I've had enough of these tactile defensive excuses. We're behind on the sandcastle project. We need hands in the sand. And very much I've I've just come back from a, a holiday down on the south coast. Um and I sat on the beach with my family and I can spot some children with some some sensory issues that are there in their wellies, in their Wellington boots, on a picnic blanket. They do not want to go off that blanket. They don't want to touch the sand. That is that they are going to sit there. Absolutely. We don't we're not enjoying this at all. Um, and that's something that we can uh, we can often see. And then we've got these are the, the, the new words, maybe to some of you, some of you may have heard this before or your own occupational therapist may have talked about vestibular sensory processing for for your children. But our vestibular um, organs are within our inner ear with our semicircular canals and our otoliths. There are organs and it detects the speed or direction of movement of the head. So that acceleration and deceleration tells us where our head is in relation to gravity. So I'm sat here now on my office chair. I'm gently, well, just for the purpose of the video, I'm spinning from side to side a little bit more or rolling back and forward, but I'm constantly getting a stream of information about where my head is in space. And it links really closely to the visual system. So for some of you out there, you may get very, very motion sickness, travel sickness, um, you might be all right as a passenger in a car, but if you're asked to read a map or, or try and read um, a list of instructions to get you somewhere, that can make you feel quite nauseous. And then there might be some others at the other end of the kind of vestibular spectrum that are absolutely thrill seekers. The higher, the faster, the spinnier, the better. You would just go on roller coaster after roller coaster or you'd be up for skydiving and huge amounts of movement. And all those factors are because of our vestibular processing. So um, it's, it's very important. And it's why um, I'm, I don't particularly get travel sick unless I'm trying to read something. And that's because while I'm, I'm sat as a passenger in the car, my eyes are taking on that information as well as my vestibular system. But when I'm distracted and I'm looking down, that impacts on my vestibular processing and creates the nausea. So we can sometimes see some individuals that are, I would say, more nervous of movement. They can be more lethargic. They, they prefer to be on the ground, um, not seeking movement. And then other individuals that I work with are, they are whirling dervishes or they are constantly in motion. That might be rocking within their wheelchair. That might be tipping from side to side that might be flinging their their head back um 
in certain movements or when you're pushing them on a swing or, or when they're, they're, they're in a, a, a soft play center or somewhere like that, they want to do it in the most daring way that they, they can to get lots and lots of vestibular information. And then we've got our sense of proprioception. So this is our sense of where our body is in, in space and it's um, our organs for this are our muscles, joints and ligaments. So every time we contract, flex and extend our, our muscles and move, we're getting that information about where we are in space. And it's generally an unconscious process. So we don't think about it, but proprioception is important for everything we do. For those of you that drive a car, it's really important that we have got good proprioceptive processing to know how much force to, to use on the accelerator and the brake. It's what, um, I've just picked up this glass, I need good proprioceptive um, feedback to know to how hard to grip this, this glass without it dropping on the floor, um, but equally not crushing it so much that it, it breaks the glass. It helps us to move, it's essential for all daily life activity, and without good proprioceptive um, input, we again rely quite heavily on our visual input so um, that's so important to, to think about in a number of our senses. When there's a challenge, we need good visual input. And what happens if we've got an individual who has got um, poor visual sensory processing or equally has got a visual impairment that can often um, sit side by side um, with many of the, um, the rare conditions that we, that we work with? So to, to do a, a short recap, Sensory processing is a neurological process that occurs in our brain and nervous system, and it organizes sensations for use in an unconscious way. We don't, we don't go, oh, today I'm going to do some sensory processing. It just happens. And it gives meaning to everything we do and every piece of information that we receive from the world around us by sifting and selecting what is important and allows us to respond in a purposeful manner. And the, the key thing, I think, often for, for parents and for educators and for those that I work with is that sensory processing forms the foundation for learning and behaviour. And what we want is for individuals to be able to respond appropriately to the sensory world around them. And what we often find or the reason why individuals get referred to a, an occupational therapist like me with a, a specialism in sensory processing is because the behaviors become maladaptive. So they are so avoidant of certain sensory stimuli that that impacts greatly on their daily life, or they are so seeking of certain sensory stimuli that that impacts greatly on daily life. Or as we'll go on to explore in a little while, their sensory profile can be at exact opposite. So they can be seeking in one sense and avoiding in another. And that can make, um, life quite challenging to uh, to plan around so a little um kind of example that i like to give to to further explain sensory processing differences is that it's a bit like divert directing the traffic um the sensations from from all the different sensory systems flow into the brain like a traffic policeman directing traffic into a big major city the brain locates, sorts and orders these sensations like a traffic policeman directing the moving cars. And when the sensations flow in a well-organized manner, the brain can use these sensations to form perceptions, behaviors and be ready for learning. But if you just imagine that traffic policeman was having a really bad day, he wasn't, he was thinking about something else. He'd just been told um, his application to, to have Christmas off has been canceled. So he just thinks, oh, stuff it. Let's just let all the all the traffic come. You soon get a gridlock or equally for the same reasons. If he just thinks, oh, I'm just going to put the stop signs out to everyone. No information comes in and the nervous system can't function. And that's a little bit like trying to explain what what happens for some individuals that, that struggle with their sensory processing. So what we know with sensory processing differences is that the sensory organs are working fine. So I'm not talking about individuals who have got a hearing impairment or individuals who have got a visual impairment. Often that can be referred to as um, a sensory deficit, but it isn't sensory processing. What we know with sensory processing is that organs are working fine, 
but it's the um, the processing bit, the internal bit with the nervous system that is the challenge. And we know that individuals can over or under respond to sensation. And I'm just going to read this little extract from the Greenspan book, The Challenging Child, because I think it, it's it's quite a good example. Imagine you're driving a car that isn't working well. When you step on the accelerator, the car sometimes lurches forward and sometimes doesn't respond. When you blow the horn, it's deafening. The brakes sometimes slow the car, but not always. The indicators work occasionally, the steering is erratic and the speedo is inaccurate. You're engaged in a constant struggle to keep the car on the road. Would you be able to concentrate on anything else? And I think that's that's so important for, for so many individuals. The, because their sensory processing is um, disrupted, they are constantly in this fight or flight or freeze mode because they're getting too much information or not enough information. And therefore, sometimes what we see is maladaptive responses and, and behaviours or distress and dysregulation. So to kind of think about the, the patterns, because what's really important to say is that everybody's sensory profile will be different. So not Every child will, with autism will have the same sensory profile. Not every child with Kleefstra syndrome will have the same pattern. It's completely unique to each individual. But what we might see is that we can have an individual that's got difficulty registering sensory information. So they're just not even noticing things. So that could be the child that has just eaten a spaghetti bolognese and they have got tomato sauce all over their face, all over their hands. They're not even aware. That's the, the individual that could have their clothes on back to front and a really high neck up here and not even notice that because they're not even registering that information. Then we've got individuals that can have difficulty attending to the important information. And that could be because they're trying to attend to everything because everything's of equally importance. And then we've got that difficulty coping with the sudden or intense um, sensation. So a loud noise um, that could be a, a, a siren coming past the front of the house that might make us all jump. But actually, we would then quickly go, oh, it's just a siren. It's fine. Whereas for, for others, that could be really distressing. Um, and then we've got that over responsivity to sensation. So somebody just brushes past them and they respond as if they've just been whacked or um, they, they might smell something and it instantly makes them retch or gag. And we've got that under responsivity to sensation. So they are seeking to get the right amount of, of input. These are the individuals that they don't want to just be sat next to you on the sofa. They want to be squeezed in next to you. They want the bigger, the better, the, the higher, the faster um, to, to be able to alert their sensory systems as to what's, what's happening. And with um, sensory integration or sensory processing, we kind of consider that there are two types of difficulties. So we can have a sensory based motor disorder, which we would refer to as dyspraxia, and we can have a modulation disorder. And today I'm going to talk much more about the modulation disorder or difficulties rather than the dyspraxia side. That's um, a whole other discussion and that has um, much more um, I think potentially that's more to, to take up with physiotherapy colleagues around the, the more movement motor control side of, of potential sensory difficulties. So what we mean by modulation is our capacity to be able to regulate and organise the degree and intensity and nature of our responses to the sensory input in a graded and adaptive manner. So this allows us to just be in that calm, alert state, ready to go. We're aware of what's in our background, but we're not so over-focused on it, or we're not needing to bump into the walls or swing or turn ourselves upside down so that that's impacting on what we're doing. So when we think about modulation, we also think about regulation. And self-regulation is that ability to attain, maintain and change our level of arousal appropriately for the task or situation. So whilst I'm here within my home, I'm kind of quite chilled out. Um, it's everything's really calm. Um, if I needed to pop out to my car on the drive while it's light and it's daytime, I wouldn't 
wouldn't hesitate and get something out of my car. But if it was 11 o'clock at night and I realised I'd left my phone charger in my car and I needed to go out, my level of arousal would be higher because I would be aware that it's dark. What's that sound? What's that noise? And that's appropriate sensory processing to, to keep me safe. And that allows us to, to sort out and tune in and out what is important and what isn't important. And that's because we want our children to be able to be alert but relax so that they can enjoy all the opportunities afforded to them and most of us as adults manage to self-regulate we have our own strategies so if I'm feeling a bit dysregulated it might be that I think oh, I've sat down I've been on a course all day today and that isn't typically me I don't typically sit down within the day I might need to go for a walk as soon as I get home or for others they might need to sit in a dark room or have a bath or do some vigorous cleaning or watch something some kind of uh, box set on the television and just zone out we've all got our ways to self-regulate but for for young children and particularly young children with additional needs it's much more about co-regulation and about us providing strategies and support to support their, their regulation and their modulation because poor modulation can lead to some difficulties with behavior so we can see this unusually high or unusually low activity levels. Often um, I get more referrals for individuals that have got more hyperactivity or, or very high activity levels that impact on them across the day. Impulsivity because of uh, how they respond to, to sensory input. Huge issues with distractibility and attention to tasks. So you will move on through tasks much, much faster um, than maybe with a typically developing individual. Disorganized, resistance to novel situations, almost that freeze. If you're going somewhere new, an environment that isn't known, that isn't sensory safe to, to that individual until they've worked it all out can be very overwhelming. Difficulty with transitions. So going from home to school, school to grandma's, those kind of things and social and emotional difficulties. So what we aim for in terms of, um, as an occupational therapist working with families and individuals with sensory processing differences, is we're aiming for individuals to be in a calm and alert state for as much of the time as possible. And what often can happen is that we can have under-responsive or hyper-responsive individuals that can appear sleepy bored or a, a little bit switched off. And then at the other end of the scale, we can get hyper or over responsive individuals. And these are the individuals that seem very, very vigilant. Um, the world feels constantly unsafe and overwhelming and out of control. And they can become very, very distressed very quickly. The, the threat, so to speak, can be real or it can be perceived. So it could be that um, Last time we came to this supermarket, the fire alarm went off. Therefore, every time I go into a supermarket and I see that type of flooring or I see that sign, um, I be become very dysregulated because how do I know that that's not going to happen again? Um, and then sometimes we can see what, what we refer to as sensory shutdown and that can appear like a frozen catatonic, very, very similar to under responsive. But actually, it's because they've become so over responsive that the nervous system has just shut down. And sadly, I have seen individuals that have gone into to that state, but it's very, very infrequent. And, and typically, we're, we're more in the, the yellow zone and we're aiming to, to provide the right sensory environment and, and provide the right input so that we're in that calm and alert, awake, relaxed and in control state. So what we do know is that sensory processing difficulties can interfere with everyday life and activities, affect behaviour and attention, and can sometimes require intervention to achieve that calm and alert state. So in terms of talking about therapy options, and this will be, um, I'm going to talk about the, the different types of therapy options, but I'm very aware within the UK that sensory trained occupational therapists are few and far between uh, it isn't always available on the on the NHS um, and in, in the US obviously you have um, many more occupational therapists that are sensory trained and are a bit further forward than, than us over here in the UK but 
might not be able to access it for a, for a range of things because your healthcare system is, is very different to ours. But there is um, what's referred to as sensory integration therapy or AIRS. Now we refer to it as AIRS sensory integration therapy, which is a specific type of intervention, which typically happens within a clinic setting. It's um, these clinic settings have got suspended equipment. So they've got swings, they've got ropes, they've got ball pools, they've got unstable surfaces, they've got tunnels, they've got scooter boards, they've got a whole range of um, pieces of equipment that are there for a skilled therapist and child to work together to um, start to make changes to a, a nervous system. So that's a kind of very specific type of intervention. What is more generally used within the, the UK is what we call sensory strategies or sensory diets. Now, sensory diets are a little bit misleading because they've got absolutely nothing to do with food. But if I think about today, I had my breakfast, went and watched my daughter play football. I came back, I had a coffee, I had a biscuit. I then had some lunch and then I've just had a drink. And then when I finish this, I'm going around to my uh, parents' house for, for supper this evening. So I've eaten and drank little and often throughout the day to keep me nourished. A sensory diet is a bespoke, personalised um, plan for an individual that provides them with the sensory input that they need little and often throughout the day to keep their nervous system nourished. So, so that's what we refer to as a, a sensory diet or a sensory strategy programme. We've then got sensory stimulation. So this often looks like a snoozeland type room, so a very low arousal environment, but with bubble tubes, with fiber optic lights, with lots of uh, visual and sometimes auditory input, sometimes with aromatherapy. So it's often a very calming environment. A lot of schools over here have a, have a sensory space like that, that can be used to just allow for, for relaxation and, and some tranquility and some exploring. And then as occupational therapists, we also look at changes to the environment or routine. So for an individual that really found eating their dinner in the in the cafeteria or the dining hall at school too much because of the smells and the noises, then we might look to, to add on to their education health plan that they needed to eat their lunch within a quieter environment. Or we might look at an individual starting their school day slightly later and finishing slightly earlier because they find the uh, the busyness of the um, of the transition too much. So those kind of adaptations to routines in terms of um, environmental items, we can look at where an individual is positioned within a classroom, or we can look at small pieces of equipment, such as ear defenders for an individual that's very auditory defensive. We could look at deep pressure garments to provide lots and lots of proprioceptive and deep pressure tactile feedback. So there is a variety of, of therapy options from an occupational therapy perspective to support any challenges within sensory processing. But what I will say is that that all needs to be done based on a, a really thorough assessment of your child. Um, otherwise, it's a bit like throwing, um, trying to, to do archery without a target. You need to know exactly where where your child's profile is. Um, you need to know what the challenges are, what are your goals and, and what is it that they're seeking or avoiding or needing some support with so that the, the programme can be really bespoke and, and create the best outcomes for your, your child. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where I would start. So um, and for most things and, and most people that, that speak to me, They'll give me a scenario and I'll say, oh, we need to start with proprioception. So in the UK, um, there's a, a team of um, therapists and they refer to proprioception as the magic muscle and the place to start. It, um, proprioception is a great organiser of all sensations. It can really help to regulate us if we can get a lot of proprioceptive input. So for those of you that have ever been um, suffered from motion sickness, Actually, if you start to feel that you're getting a bit queasy or a bit unwell, pressing down hard, like trying to lift yourself off your chair with your hands or pulling on a pull up bar or pressing your feet really hard into the ground to activate those muscles, joints and ligaments can actually start to make you feel a bit better. 
it can start to calm you. It's why when you're very, very upset and somebody gives you like a really big bear hug squeeze, you can feel that you kind of start to calm a little bit better. Um, proprioception can um, increase alertness, but it's also known to decrease anxiety. It has um, that calming property. And um, it can reduce fidgetiness and improve concentration. So often when I'm writing a sensory diet for an individual, we're putting lots and lots of proprioceptive activities, which tend to look like movement activities um, for an individual, whether that's resistant bands attached to their chair that they pull up, or if they're ambulant and they're able to, it might be carrying heavy items, having a weighted backpack, pushing a, a a heavy trolley um, along a corridor, wiping um, down tables or wiping down the little individual whiteboards that are used at school, um, crawling, lots and lots of activities to promote proprioceptive input that can, across the course of a day, it has a cumulative effect. It feeds that nervous system and it can really support with regulation. So we use um, it proprioception in combination with actively engaging them in movement and in learning. So rather than kind of having arbitrary tasks, we will try and fit it into the, the routine so it becomes functional in order to have that calming and alerting effect on the nervous system. And it is so rarely overloading for individuals that it's the kind of that's why we call it the place to start, because you can't do a lot wrong with, with adding proprioception into a child's daily plan. And what we have seen because of the, the pandemic over the last 18 months or so is I've seen many more dysregulated children. And in part, that's because many individuals have been at home for longer. Their regular clubs, their swimming, their trampolining or rebound activities. Um, their trips to the, the park, the going to, to out to, to do activities has been reduced within school. They're not moving around school in the same way. They're having their lunches delivered to the classroom. They've got very strict timetabling on the playground. So they can't, the teacher can't just think, oh, we're a bit bubbly, let's go out and play. Because actually you can't, you can't clash with other groups. And I've seen um, many more dysregulated children and We've hypothesized that that's because of the reduction in movement and in that ability to gain proprioceptive input to, to support the, the nervous system. And the, the way we do it is through active resistance. So that's stretching, so pushing, pulling, lifting, um, weight bearing activities are, are so important to, to provide proprioception. So generally, my advice is to encourage as much movement as your child can, um, can, can do to, to fit opportunities in every day. So that carrying, moving, cleaning furniture, um, having things attached to their chairs that they can pull up on or that they can push or weighted bean bags, those kind of things. Playground equipment is absolutely great for providing progress, active input, uh, a trumpet or a like a gym ball, like a yoga Swiss ball can be really good to, to get both vestibular and proprioceptive feedback. And air cushions that can go on chairs that can give them some ability to, to wobble and to move. Movement breaks very important within, within school the school day. So I've just put up, I know that this, this is recorded, so you'll, you'll be able to, um, to watch back later. I've just put a few different organisations and some, some resources there that, that might be useful or some places if you're interested in learning a bit more about sensory integration. Um, there's some US sites and some UK sites there um, to, to have a read through and to, to find out a little bit more. Um, and there we go. That's the kind of the formal part of today um, finished. So I will stop screen sharing now and we can uh, open up and see if there's any questions.